When we started Hope Fellowship in January of 2000, we had a simple vision of creating a place where we were all comfortable inviting our friends and that they would all come back. That's been our focus since day one. We've seen the church grow, get on mission, and make an impact in this community. But this area continues to grow at a rapid rate. It is constantly rated as not only one of the fastest growing areas in the country, but one of the best places to live, raise a family, or build a business. And I just can't seem to shake the vision God has given us for this area, but also the responsibility we have in reaching people. We will never stop doing whatever we can to reach this area because we believe in hope. And we believe hope is here for a reason, that hope belongs here. Hope belongs here for the single mom struggling to make ends meet, for the executive from Plano who has all the money and career success she could hope for, but her family is falling apart and her kids are running away from God. For the teenager who struggles with self-worth and wondering if she is loved by anyone, hope belongs here. It's here for the child who finally gets the care and attention he needs when he comes to Adventure Kid. Hope belongs here for the father of three, addicted to pornography, and just wonders if it has finally wrecked his marriage. For the international family who just moved from thousands of miles away for work, but are lonely. Hope belongs here. Well, good morning and welcome to all of our campuses, those of you watching online, all of us here at Frisco East. Man, I'm so glad you're here for week two of, of Hope Belongs Here. If you missed last week, please go back and watch hopefellowship.net slash watch, and you can, you can see what we talked about last week because it really kind of sets up this week. Um, but before I dive into part two, um, I think it's important that I, that I say something. Anytime we talk about church stuff, you know, organizational, um, our mission as a corporate body, uh, sometimes it gets lost in the, in the passion and in the call of God on our lives as a church to really understand that everyone who comes into this room comes in for a reason. And maybe you came into one of our campuses, maybe you're watching you know, maybe by accident, but you're here, or maybe you're here at Frisco East, and you walked in with a ton of pain in your life. Your marriage, if you were honest, your marriage really, really uh, is challenging. Your finances, uh, a doctor's report, you're in depression right now for some reason or another, and those things are real. And I just want you to know that as I talk about the passion of our church and and it's a great time to come if you're new to Hope because you find out a lot about our, our heart and, and hopefully your heart today. But the reality is I understand and we all understand that, that you may have come and you need something from God. I just want you to know that you can get it, that he loves you and he's got a plan for your life. And, and uh, our heart is that you would know that in, even in talking about uh, how passionate I am about what God is doing here in our church. And on a side note to that, or kind of follow up in our country, we're in, a, we're in a mess as a country, and especially as it relates to racism. And, you know, by 2017, I'll be honest with you, I, I just, you would just think that we would be so far beyond this. The hate, the just ugliness of it all, and um, I know I can't speak to CNN or to Fox News or NBC, or CBS or ABC. I, I can't speak for, you know, all Christians, and I certainly can't speak to the world on, on this subject, but I can speak to us who call ourselves believers. And, and just to remind you that even though that is, you know, several states away, and, and sometimes when it's, you know, in Virginia or sometimes if it's in Michigan or California or Alabama or wherever, it, it just seems like, oh man, I hope, I hope everything's okay over there, but you're safe and sound right here. I just want you to know that racism, racism exists right here. And, and that's unfortunate that it, that it is anywhere, but I know some of us were raised in cultures and raised in homes that promoted this kind of hatred. And uh, I just, I, you need to know, and I've told you this over and over, but you need to know that there is no place for this in the heart of a believer, none. There's no place for this in the church at all. 
And so, and I say this in love, if you, if you were raised in that culture and you really struggle with that, see me after service, I'm gonna get you in a headlock and just pour the love of Jesus all over you. But it, 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 if, if you come from a different country and you're here today, maybe you're from India, uh, maybe you're from Pakistan, maybe you're from Africa, maybe you're from China or somewhere in Asia or South America or Mexico or Canada, wherever you, wherever you come from, you are welcome at Hope Fellowship. And I hope and pray that that would become a, a trend in our nation and especially in our churches because as Martin Luther King Jr. said, um, only love, only love can drive out hate. Only love. And so may you feel the love of God here, no matter the color of your skin, no matter your religious background, no matter your culture background. May you sense the love of God in his people here at Hope. And um, that's our prayer. And so if you came in hurting, hurting for our country, just know that last week when I talked about our mission as a church, I used a powerful scripture found in Jeremiah 29, 11, and, and, it's, it's, and, and Isaiah 6. But Jeremiah 20, 11 is written in the context of tremendous pain and tremendous chaos and actual uh, captivity. The, the children of Israel, the country of Israel was gonna be brought into captivity in Babylon and they would be there for 70 years and they would be slaves and they would be servants and it was not their home. And in the middle of that chaos and challenge, in the middle of the confusion and bitterness, he would write these words in Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good, not for disaster, for a future and a hope. So in the midst of your challenge, in the midst of your dilemma, in the midst of your pain, just know the heart of the Father. He knows the pain, he knows the challenge, he knows the captivity, but he has a plan. And that plan is good, it's for a future, and it's for a hope. Isaiah chapter six, verse eight, talks about here am I, send me. The whole heart of hope is that, that God you've placed us in an area of tremendous growth and potential. May we always have our hands up to say, yes, here am I, send me. We also talked about our, our kind of a tagline here at Hope is that lost people matter to God. And if they matter to God, they should matter to me. They should matter to us as a church. That, that really does uh, ring true here, that lost people matter. And everything we do is kind of seen through that lens. That lost people matter to God, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe or would believe would not perish. See, that matters to God. Enough that he would send his son to, to reconcile us and forgive us of our sins and connect us to the Father once again. Well, that's our job as well. Then finally, talked about this. Love, connect, grow, serve. This is our mission here at Hope. We want people to love God, love their neighbor. We want them to connect to others and connect to a mission that's larger than themselves. We want them to grow in their faith and serve the church, serve the community, and serve the world. That's our mission. Everything we do flows through those four things. Love, connect, grow, serve. Now, that's our mission, and I talked about that last week, so that's why I want you to go watch it if you, didn't, if you weren't here. But the question for today is, what is your mission? Why are you here? Not just at Hope, but why do you exist? Why were you born? What is your purpose? That's what I want to talk about today. As a church, our mission is to love, connect, grow, serve, but what is your mission and how do you connect to our mission organizationally as a church body? Jesus um, was baptized in the River Jordan. He comes out, the Holy Spirit descends, the Father speaks and says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased and he's filled with the spirit and he's led into the desert to be tempted of the enemy and for 40 days and 40 nights he's there. He comes off of that journey and he begins to teach in the areas of, in which he was raised and in Luke chapter four, the same question that I asked you, what is your mission? Jesus gives us his. Luke chapter four, verse 14, here's what it says. Then Jesus turned or returned to Galilee, filled with the Holy Spirit's power. Reports about him spread quickly through the whole region. He taught regularly in the, their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to the village of Nazareth, his boyhood home, he went as usual to the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read the scriptures. 
The scroll of Isaiah, the prophet, was handed to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where, the, where this was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me. Now he gets into his mission right here to bring good news to the poor. See, his mission wasn't, I'm going to establish a kingdom. We're going to overthrow Rome, and I'm going to make it very, very good for us. What is his mission? Interestingly enough, that's what they thought it would be, but that wasn't. He said, I want to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see. This is not all physical. This is in a spiritual sense as well. Both, both of them, we would see that he would do miracles and the blind would see and demon possessed would be freed. But it's also spiritual in a sense that we can be freed from our sin. Our eyes can be opened that the oppressed will be set free and that the time of the Lord's favor has come, that his grace would be rolled out lavishly for those who did not deserve it. And he rolled up the scroll, handed it back to the attendant and sat down. All eyes in the synagogue looked at him intently. Then he began to speak to them. The scripture you've just heard has been fulfilled this very day. So this is Jesus' mission. This is why he exists. In other words, this is why I came. I want to bring good news to the poor, and I want to set the captive free, and I want to open blind eyes and so forth. This is why he came, and the question is, why are we here? That's a good question. One year ago, this very week, I sat at a conference, the Leadership Summit. It's one that we usually we go, we've gone to, I've gone to many, many, many years the Leadership Summit is, is a tremendous conference of a bunch of leaders from all businesses, from all churches, whatever, and there's, there's a, a host of, of stuff. But it was the first session that wrecked me. It was the first section that I don't remember hardly anything else after that, that the Lord, I really, began, I really believe, began to deal with me and, and sent me on a, a focused season of prayer for my life. I don't think it was just because I was turning 50 in a month. You know how you get nostalgic and you kind of go, okay, well, man, what am I going to do? I'm turning 50, I'm a has-been or whatever. But the, the, it was more than that, right? It was more than just trying to figure that out. It was, it was I believe, a call in my life to say, hey, you have, a, you have a certain amount left in your leadership, so a certain amount of years left, what are you going to do with those? And it sent me on this prayer journey, and there are four things that I came up with among many that I wrote down and Man, I have pages of notes on this, but the four things that I really believe, and I joke about this, about me going to Colorado and starting a campus, you know, a Hope Fellowship campus there, here I am, send me, Lord, if that would be your call, but um, that's really not what I think is going to happen. I, I feel like for the rest of my leadership life that the Lord has me here at Hope in Frisco, Texas and the surrounding areas, and, and I feel like for the next whatever it is, 15, 20 14, I don't know, but what, for the next leadership years of my life, these are the four things that I want to concentrate on, and I think they're, they're pretty significant for me. Number one is Hope's Weekends. I want, to, I want to make sure that the teaching and the preaching of God's word is filled with his grace, his love, and his word, and that this would be a place in which you can invite your friends far from God, and that on any given weekend, you would think, man, I'm excited to bring my friends. The second is Hope's Ministries, and this would be a passion of mine that all of our ministries would continue to get better, and we would continue to disciple, and we'd continue to reach, and we'd continue to love with everything that we have to serve the people in which in whom God sends us. So the Hope Ministries are very important to me. The next, the third, is campus development and church planting. So I see in the next several years, I see more campuses in our surrounding area and church planting outside of that. In fact, we just sent somebody a couple weeks ago, our, our former Frisco West Campus Pastor Gavin and his wife are, are going to uh, Argyle and, and the Roanoke area, and we just sent them off with blessing and money and people and said, hey, we, we want to, we, I see more of that. And the last is uh, next generation leadership, which I'm very excited about. These four things are, are, are a passion of mine. And next generation leadership, you don't know what that means, it's our resident program but it's also, if you don't know this, in the next year, we're, having, we're starting this fall, but next year will be the big launch of Southeastern University right here at Hope Fellowship. We're starting a, a university here 
that will train the next generation of pastors and children's pastors and student pastors and worship leaders and missionaries or whatever. And when they finish the undergrad and, and hopefully go through the seminary program, they will, be, they will have no debt. And that is a passion of mine. And I'm very, very excited. So for the next leadership season of my life, those four things, I want to pour everything. Now, there's some things around it, motorcycle riding, but the, other than that, those are, the, those are the things that I'm passion, passionate about. So um, in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus gives or tells a story, and this story would change my life. A year and a half ago, when you get hired here at Hope, um, we go, the people who are trying to get hired, they go through a battery of tests. There's many, and you know, businesses do this all the time. We do it as well. We have like four or five tests that we send you through, Myers-Briggs, Strengths Finder. Our newest one is Cultural Index. It's a very fascinating, it's the easiest test that we give. It's a, it's a, it's a list of 100 questions. There's two questions. One question has 100 words. The second question has about 100 words or so. And then you just circle the ones that best describe you. And that's the test. It's really simple. But the results are astounding and, and they're pretty telling and, and it just helps us to have a blueprint. It's not, it's not end all be all, but it's, it's, a, it's, a good, it's a good test. So we use all these. And so a year and a half ago, we added uh, cultural index. And so we all as staff members took it. And the, the index comes back on me. And so our, our guy that's walking us through this, great guy, his name's Mark Conley, and he's walking us through our tests and he comes to me and he says, John, your, your chest was really surprising. And he says, man, you know, most churches of this size are led by a type A personalities. So you know, you know what type A personalities mean? I mean, they are the ones who, I mean, they are great leaders and they, I mean, my way or the highway, I've got a vision, we're marching up the hill and this is the way we're gonna do it. And when they come into a meeting, they take charge and they, and, he, and so he's, he's talking about this and he says, man, on your scale, that, that A part is like in the middle and you really shouldn't be leading this church. <laughs> those weren't exact words, but those were kind of the words he said. And I was like, you're fired. But it made me think, it made me think of, okay, so, so if that's true, if most churches are led by, and I don't know if this is really true, I don't think it is, I think any personality God can use, okay? I, I really do think that. But if most larger churches are led by those kind of guys, what is it about me that, that is different? And I'm not saying it's different than anybody else, but I just, I just kind of I thought about this for the last year and a half. I'm kind of like, man, I, maybe I'm more A than I think I am. It just is disguised by my niceness. Right? Maybe? Maybe not. But Matthew 25 was the revelation for me. Because this, this story that Jesus tells, it adjusts my personality. What, what, is, what is a normal personality? I'm very laid back. I'm shy. I'm, I don't like confrontation. I just want everybody to love me, and I want to please everybody. And that's more of my makeup than just like, I'm, I'm going, and I'm, I don't care who who is in charge or who's, who's in front of me, I'm gonna mow them over. No, that's not my personality. But when I get to Matthew 25, it changes everything. And it should change it for you as well. Jesus tells the story of, of an owner of a lot of money who is going to take a trip. And so he brings three servants in, and these are not the real amounts, but I'm just gonna use them just for our sake today. He gives one $5 million, he gives one $2 million, and he gives one $1 million. And he says, now I'm going on a trip, and, and I just want you to steward what I'm giving you, and when I come back, we're going to settle up and see where you are and see how you invested and see what you've done with the money. And so he goes on his trip, and the first guy with five, he doubles what he's been given. And the guy comes back from his long trip, and he calls the three servants in, and he asks the first one, hey, what did you do with the money? And the first guy says, I doubled it. Here's, here's 10. Oh, man, well done. Well done. He brings the second guy in, and, and he says, hey, how did it go for you? And you had two million. What, what happened? He says, well, I, I, here's four. I doubled it. The, the last guy comes in. He says, I'll give you a million, man. How, how did it go? And he says, here's your, here's your million back. 
He says, well, um, why didn't you invest it at least? And gets a little bit of interest. And he says, well, I didn't want to lose anything, so I just hid it until you would come back. And the owner says, you wicked, lazy servant. This story adjusts my personality. This story, even though I am laid back and easy to get along with for the most part, would change the way I look at life and my call and my mission personally. Because when I stand before the Lord, and, and I will, I don't, want him to, I, don't, I don't want him to say, hey, what'd you do? And I said, well, according to cultural index, um, I wasn't really wired to do much. <laughs> Stupid test. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I did okay. No, 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 no. When I stand before the Lord, I, there'll, be, there'll be other things that he corrects me on, and I, I know for sure, but the one thing that I want him to look at me and say, hey, what I gave you, you doubled. Well done. Well done. See, see, as a church, our mission, when I talked about last week, and I, and I, just, I just talk with such passion because I do have, I have this passion that lost people matter to God because he says, Jesus says in Matthew 28, 19, go into all the world and preach the gospel, baptizing, making disciples, baptizing them, making in, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. I believe that to my core. There's nothing that you could ever tell me that would stop me from believing that mission, the great commission. Nothing you could tell me. The story of, the, of, of, of these, these guys who are stewards, it keeps me up at night. It gets me motivated for the next day because I want to live my life on mission, but our mission as a church is only as good as you. For instance, for, in other words, our buildings, Frisco West, for instance, over at 423 in Maine, or McKinney at 380 and 75, or this campus here on Rolliter Road. I mean, these buildings do not have a mission. The beautiful building that we're getting ready to build, and that we're building now, they just laid the concrete, and the, or the foundation, which is really cool. They're gonna lay the arena uh, thing, I think, this week. But anyway, that, that, those things have no mission. It, that could be a concert hall in 10 years. It could be anything. It could be a civic center. It could be whatever. I mean, the buildings have no mission. So our mission as a church is not corporate. It is personal. It has to be personal. So we've been given, all of us, a stewardship responsibility personally. And, and it, it becomes corporate only because we're a part of this church. And when we all bring our individual missions together, and hopefully they're in alignment, it makes for a mission that would change the world. So uh, at, let me give you an example of, of, of the, the magnitude of our, of our responsibility. Um, I'm going to put on the screen maps of our different campuses and all the people that are the families that come. Frisco West, for instance, um, in this area, so this represents families, which represents thousands of people that, that call Frisco West their home. Um, we got people in Anna that go to Frisco West campus. People in Anna, did you know that we have a McKinney campus right, like right south of you? You know, like right, right there? Oh, whatever. But you can go wherever you want to. But this is the West Campus with reference thousands. So McKinney Campus, here we have McKinney Campus. Um, we have all those green dots. This represents McKinney. And here's 380 and 75. Our campuses is right there. And we have a person in Aubrey or a family in Aubrey or many families that, that, I mean, did you know that we have a campus just like right here? You know, right here. I didn't know if you knew that. But anyway, um, this is McKinney, represents thousands of people that make that their church home. And then Frisco East, which is in the middle of all this. Frisco East have thousands and thousands that call this their church home. These, are, these represents families. You put it all together uh, across the, the whole thing, and you can't even see all the blue because it's covered up by the green and the red. But anyway, this is, this is our whole church. Now, the reason I give this to you is the stewardship responsibility that we have. This represents, on a monthly basis, okay, so every month, 
at Frisco West, at Frisco East, at McKinney Campus, this doesn't include online, it doesn't include Wednesday nights with our student ministry or children's, but on the weekend, 13,845 people call this their church home. 13,000 on a monthly, individuals, that's children um, and, and adults, call this their church home every single month. That's 13,000 845 people that if those people were on mission, how many think our area would look different? If we were really individually, not just corporal, hey, John, hey, I love, your, I love your passion, dude. We're behind you. Do you understand that this is not just John's mission? This is our mission as, as stewards. As stewards. No, so, so when you say, what am I steward of? My, my, I can sing, or I have money I can give, or I uh, am an encourager, or I am a counselor, or whatever. Those are great gifts. But the stewardship responsibility that we all have, that we all share, because not everybody can sing, not everybody is an encourager, not everybody can counsel, but what we all have is a stewardship responsibility to where we've been placed. And I know that we don't have great mountains here in the Frisco area. And I know we don't have great beaches, although Little Elm provides us a great beach that I think is 100 yards by 25 yards. But we live in a stewardship responsibility. In, in fact, in the next few years, 15 or so years, just the two cities that we have campuses in right now, here's the build-out population for Frisco, 375,000, for McKinney, 357,000. Now, if you just round it up to 300 each, that's 600,000 people in just the two cities that we're in right now. Does not include Plano, the Colony, Savannah, Little Elm, Providence Village, Aubrey, Prosper, Salina, Melissa, Anna, Farmersville, Princeton, Allen, even a little bit of Murphy down here, that doesn't even include all that. So if you're, just, if you're just looking at the area in which we're in the smack dab middle of, almost 1.5 million people. That's, I think, bigger than the population of Dallas are going to be right around us. And I know many of you are saying, they're not gonna be around me, I'm out. <laughs> I know that. Those of you who don't have a mission, you're moving. But if you do have a mission and you love Jesus, you will stay and help us. <laughs> Thus says the word of the Lord. So, no, I'm, I'm, I'm just being serious. So, if, um, if you take this stewardship responsibility for us, and we say, man, hope, man, we, can't, we, we, we literally cannot build the, the campuses fast enough. And I know that we're not the only church going. There are many great churches here that are, most of them are all my friends that I know and, and they're doing great work and we're just one of many that are trying to do stuff to, to help uh, bring Jesus to hurting people. But the stewardship responsibility that we have nonetheless is so important, but it has to be personal. It just can't be in a sticker. It just can't be in a mission statement on a wall or website. It has to be, it has to be personal. Jesus is teaching at a, uh, a house, a big house. Let's just say in our area, you know, a nice size home and there are many people, it's an open floor plan and there are many people that are on the patio that are sitting outside by the pool and, and there are people that are even outside of the house listening through the windows because he is so popular. He has healed diseases. He has raised the dead. This guy teaches like no other rabbi has ever taught and they're just fascinated with this personality of a man called Jesus. Well, some friends in the area have a friend who is paralyzed and they're saying and thinking, hey, we need to get our friend to Jesus. So by the time they get him, by the time they get him on the stretcher or on the mat and they, they make their way over to the house, the house is completely filled and they can't get through. 
But this doesn't stop them. They would, as you probably know or may know the story, they, they get up on the roof of this home and they would cut a hole in the top of the roof. And, and how they did this without the, you know, the mud or the hay or you know, whatever was falling, but they did. They cut a hole and they would lower their friend right in front of Jesus as he's teaching. I mean, I can't imagine the commotion. And the guy is lame and he can't walk. And Jesus, Jesus' first words would not be, hey, get up, get up and walk. I'm gonna heal you. This is gonna be really cool. You ready? He doesn't say, hey, where are the, where's the YouTube cameras? Let's go. You ready? You know who he would talk to? He would look up at the roof and he would talk to the friends. And he said to the friends, because of your faith, I'm gonna change this guy's life. And he heals the guy. And the guy is freaked out. The crowd is astonished. Because a few friends had faith. A few friends lived on mission. And how many, listen to me, everybody look at me, how many lame friends do you have? And I don't mean lame as they're, they're not good friends. I mean they're sick. And they need to be lowered to encounter Jesus. Peter and John are the men leading the, the, the New Testament church after Jesus has been uh, crucified, he's been resurrected, he's ascended to heaven, now they're in charge. Peter's the big man on campus, right? He, everybody's following him, and he's, and he's in Jerusalem, he's going through the temple gates, and, and the customary thing for people who were disabled, um, this one happened to be, again, paralyzed, um, the customary thing was for, for them to be in, a, in a, a prominent place so that people, many, as many people could could pass by them, and they had a clay pot that they would just hold out and, please help, please help. There was no Medicaid. There, there were no organizations that, that were, you know, there to, to help financially. This was the way they lived on the compassion of their fellow Jewish brothers and sisters. And this guy was standing there, or sitting there, sorry, he was at his pot and his clay pot, <laughs> And Peter and John would walk by him, and Peter would say, oh, John, wait a minute, hold on just a minute. And he would look at the guy, and he would say, hey, um, look at me. And the guy is like, oh, good. Thank you, man. He goes, I'm not going to give you any money. That's not what I have. And you can imagine the guy just going, well, then why did you stop me? Why did you stop? Just you know, let me talk to somebody else. And but, but Peter just says, hey, silver and gold I don't have, but what I do have, in the name of Jesus, I want you to get up and rise. And he pulls him up, and his ankles, his knees, his hips, his back, totally healed. How many lame friends do you have? How many lame family members? Do you have Luke chapter 15? It's one of my favorite in the Gospels. Jesus will tell a story, three stories actually. The religious leaders are very, very ticked at Jesus. They, they do not understand his methods and he is notoriously involved in the lives of sinners. Tax collectors, drunks, prostitutes, and so they're really criticizing. And because, because they're there this time, Jesus tells these three stories right in a row. The first one is the story of the lost sheep. There was once a shepherd who was tending a hundred sheep. One gets away and becomes lost. And the shepherd leaves the 99 and he goes and gets the one and he brings it back and he calls all his shepherd friends and they have a party because his lost sheep was found. Next story. There's a lady 
who is poor and she has a coin that is uh, worth a year's wages, but she's lost it. Kind of like we lose our keys. And she's lost it. She turns her house upside down trying to find this coin. And she finds it and she calls all her friends and she says, celebrate with me because I found my lost coin. Third story. This one's different. The prodigal son. I won't go into the whole story, but a son wants his inheritance now because he's tired of living under his dad's rules. So his dad gives him the money and he goes off and he lives unwisely and he's wild. And his father prays probably, longs for his son to come back and he's on the porch and he sees his prodigal son walking and he runs He runs to meet his son on the road and he embraces him and he calls him in. He calls all his friends to have a party and a celebration because his lost son has come home. Now here's my question. How many lost sheep are in your family? How many lost sheep are in your influence? How many lost coins? How many prodigals? And sometimes you go after them and you find them and sometimes you just wait for them to come home. But when they come home, the, the attitude and the response isn't, it's about time. Hope you learned your lesson. The attitude isn't any of those things, but the attitude of the father, the attitude of the father, oh man, I'm so glad you're here. The attitude of the father wasn't, man, you need to take a shower. You, you reek with the lifestyle that you've lived. And I wonder in our church here in, in religious communities and the climate in Jesus' day, first century, I, mean, I just wonder how many of us fall into that religious category rather than the Jesus category. So I gave you a map when you walked in across all of our campuses, it looks like this. Would you grab that? So let me, let me explain just real quick. I don't have much time, but let me explain. This is a map of where we live, and I know that you're, if you live in Prosper or Salina or the outskirts of this map, it's not on there. And the reason is, if we clicked one more down, it would erase all the streets. So uh, we, instead of doing that and getting everybody in there, so I'm gonna have you, out, you know, just write, write on the back of it or draw on the back of it where, you know, Prosper or Salina or wherever you live and just draw it in there and you can just put a little dot where you live. But the point of this, as I gave you a domino or a cup or a paint stick or a stake or a tree ring or a sticker or, you know, whatever we've given in the past few years to write names down, here's what I want you to do. I want you to put this somewhere or you can recreate this to, to, to your, own, uh, fam- your own neighborhood, whatever you want to do, but find, put this somewhere with names of people that are far from God on the bottom. Maybe initials, maybe family members that you're praying for. Just you know, code it however you want to, but this, this would be a, a, a reminder of the lost sheep, of the lost coins, of the prodigals, of the lame people in your life. If you don't have a sticker, I talk about this a lot. Uh, I joke about it that our ushers are putting them on your cars right now. If you don't, I won't. I wouldn't do that to you. But, but I'm not one that likes stickers. I don't. I've never put any stickers on my car. I just don't like stickers on my car. But the hope one, I have to, right? I'm the pastor. I have to do that. But how many of those stickers? If we had 13,845 people with stickers on their car, how many know that people would be like, "What is that?" And it would start conversations. My point, my point is let's get on mission. And here's my last thing, last thing. I think the struggle with us in North Dallas, the struggle with us because our economy is so good, our lives are so good, and not, I know that's not everybody, but as a general whole, this area, our staff members can't even hardly live here in this city because the housing's too too high. We live in in a tremendous area. I love it, but along with that comes some baggage. And I have a feeling that if Jesus, in some of our lives, including mine, were to give us a grade, 
like he did in Revelation chapter 2 and 3 of some of the churches in the modern day Turkey area. I wonder if he would say this of us, Revelation chapter 2. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. I wonder if the reason why we're not more on mission is because the things in our lives that we can accumulate, the things in our lives that we hold dear, the, the next house, the next car, boat, motorcycle, you put in, you fill in the blank, those things mean so much more to us. And we have lost perspective. We've lost our first love as a church, as an individual who's a part of a church. And I want to challenge you today to live your life on mission. You don't have to go overseas to live your life on mission. You do it right here, right now, in your neighborhood, at your work, in your school. That's where we go. So in just a minute, across all of our campuses, I've asked the, the worship team to come and lead us into a song that would get us to that place. I want to ask you not to leave, not to go get your kids ahead of everybody else because you're not on mission. I want you to just repent if need be. Adjust if need be. What is God speaking to you? And let's return to our first love. As hard as that is, let's return to our first love. And let's live on mission. Hope belongs here in this area. And you bring that hope to the lame, to the blind, to the lost. You and me both, living on mission. This, this area will not be the same. Lord, Lord, May your words uh, that we've read and, and the words that I've tried to use, use, I believe, anointed by your spirit, graced by what you're wanting to do in us, may we not forsake our first love. May we not be so consumed with what we're doing and what we're trying to accomplish and what we're trying to do in the natural and that may we look through the eyes of the Father and may we go after that lost sheep and that coin and may we embrace the son who comes back or the daughter who comes back with a heart of compassion and grace. May we as a church made up of a lot of individuals live on mission. And may our, may our area never be the same because hope belongs here. In Jesus' name I pray.